All right, welcome back, Chemistry 111, gentlemen. We've got exam number two right around the corner, and I made, uh, due to popular demand, a big old packet of practice problems. And I will just apologize, this is gonna be a long YouTube video, so feel free to skip around to the parts that are most useful. However, I think having more problems like you guys have asked uh, is a better uh, situation than having not enough. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Okay. This first one, we've got, uh, what do we got here? We've got a reaction, and it's asking you to not only predict the products, but also balance the reaction. And so if you look at this, we've got some calcium hydroxide. This is aqueous. It's a soluble hydroxide. You've got some sulfuric acid here. Remember, sulfuric acid, the first loss of hydrogen is a strong acid. And so acid plus base, this is going to form some water, right? This is a neutralization reaction. So we'll throw some water there, and that's most likely going to be liquid water. And then we're going to have a salt form, right? And this salt is going to be the combination of calcium plus sulfate, which will give you calcium sulfate. They're both, uh, let's see, calcium 2 plus, sulfate 2 minus. So there you go. And this is one where you probably want to go to your table of solubilities because this is really important. Whenever you form, form a salt, you need to figure out, is it soluble? And in this case, I believe the solubility table will tell you that most sulfates are indeed soluble. However, calcium is one of the exceptions, which makes it insoluble, which makes it solid, which we will call this the precipitate, right? The calcium sulfate precipitate. So this is kind of a neat example where you get an acid-base reaction that actually forms a precipitate. So kind of cool. Uh, we should probably balance this, right? That's important. We've got one calcium here, one calcium there, one sulfate there, one sulfate there. Uh, but we got two OHs and we've got two uh, H's, so we should probably put a two there uh, to make two molecules of water to make sure everything balances. I think that looks good. So we got four hydrogens, four hydrogens, two oxygens, two oxygens, and we're all set. The next one's a little bit more challenging. It says write the net ionic equation for the reaction above, and we're going to do this step by step. First, I'm going to write the complete ionic, and then I'm going to cancel things that are identical, repeat identical on both sides. So calcium hydroxide, that's an aqueous soluble salt, so I'm going to break that up, and that's going to give me, um, I'm going to get a calcium uh, 2 plus, that is uh, aqueous, right? Don't forget your phases, really important. In this case, I get two, count them, two hydroxides. So be careful about your uh, stoichiometry there. Those are going to be aqueous. And then I've got what? Now sulfuric acid is kind of tricky because sulfuric acid is indeed one of your strong acids. However, remember that only the first loss of hydrogen, repeat, only the first loss of hydrogen is a strong acid. So that means when this one dissociates, you're going to get an H plus, and that's going to be aqueous and you're gonna get what's left over, which is the hydrogen sulfate. Hydrogen sulfate is a one minus, and it is not, repeat, not a strong acid, so it stays mostly as hydrogen sulfate, or bisulfate if you prefer that terminology. Um, I believe that is it for the reactant side, and then we're gonna go to the product side, and we're gonna get what? We're gonna have uh, two waters, right? Water is a covalent molecule, so that does not break apart, so we keep that as water. And then finally, remember that calcium sulfate, uh, calcium sulfate, excuse me, is a uh, precipitate, so that is a solid. It is most definitely not breaking up because it is not soluble. So we leave that as is. And then we can look at this and we can say, hey, calcium, there's no calcium 2 plus. You can't cancel that. You can't cancel the hydroxide. You can't cancel the H plus. And you most certainly can't cancel the uh, hydrogen sulfate. So there's nothing to cancel. So this ends up being our net ionic equation as written. Nothing to cancel, so we just leave it as is. Okay, so the next part wants us to look at uh, a limiting reagent problem here. And so this one combines a little bit of solution chemistry like we've dealt with. And so uh, we've got um, some known amount of base, right? And we can call the this guy base, and we've got some known amount of acid, and we can call this A for acid if you like to make abbreviations. If you do make abbreviations on the exam, you need to label them so I know what they are. You can't just make things up with no labels or else I'm not gonna know what you're doing. So I'm gonna go ahead, and this is, looks like a, we know we have some reactant and some reactant, so we need to figure out what is our limiting reagent, right? This is kind of a, uh, a nod to earlier in the semester. So I'm gonna start with the base. I'm gonna say I've got 
uh, what I've got 0 0.95 moles of base over liters of base right that comes from my concentration there uh, and then I'm gonna say okay well I know the volume there I can convert that quite easily to liters and I can say 0 0.2500 liters of base right and in this case I know that for every one mole of base I get one mole of the precipitate right because we're looking at mass of precipitate and what is that precipitate I'm gonna go ahead and write it out I'm gonna write calcium sulfate however if you wanted to call it PPT for precipitate I would have taken that too and then finally you know that there's one mole of calcium sulfate and you use the periodic table and I got 136 point uh, what did I get 1 4 grams of calcium sulfate per mole if I crank that out I get roughly and I'm stuck with what I'm stuck with two sig figs because of the point one the point nine five so that means if I round this it's gonna be about uh, 32 grams of that calcium sulfate if all of it reacted but we don't know we have to figure out which one runs out first again our limiting reagent so the second one what am I gonna get I'm gonna get um, oh let's see I'm gonna start with my uh, molarity of my acid the molarity of the acids pretty easy on this one it's 1.00 moles of acid uh, per liter of acid solution um, I'm, I've got what a little bit different volume here so 0 0.2250 liters of acid solution and then I know I've got one mole of acid for every one mole of the precipitate that calcium sulfate right and then the molar mass is the same as above. We can just write that down. Uh, grams of calcium sulfate. And then that's per one mole of calcium sulfate, just like above. And this one, for some reason, I can't read it on my paper, so I'm gonna have to go ahead and multiply again here on the fly. Um, 136.14. And I got, oh, this is kinda neat. Now this time we have three sig figs, so we can say we have 30.6 grams of calcium sulfate and so if you look at this you'll see that this is the smallest amount so that means that this guy the acid actually runs out first so the acid right the acid is our limiting reagent that's really important and the limiting reagent determines our theoretical yield right that's really important so that's the theoretical yield of the um, precipitate and down here it says calculate the actual mass of precipitate produced if the yield was 87.5 percent well that's really easy we take the theoretical yield and we say if we had 100 percent we would have had 36 30.6 however we don't we only have 0 0.875 and then if you crank that one out uh, times 0.875 i got what did i get i got i got three sig figs still so this is going to be 20 uh, 6.8 grams of calcium sulfate so that's how much I get that's a really neat combination of stuff from exam 2 and from exam 1 so hopefully it jogs your memory a little bit but again nothing that's totally totally different okay Let's scroll down a little bit here now this next one number two says circle any of the solutions below that are strong electrolytes strong electrolytes remember electrolyte is something that breaks up to give you ions in solution I consider strong electrolytes to be things that completely uh, break up and so if I look at something like sodium chloride well we know that's a soluble salt so if we dissolve this in water it's gonna break up entirely into sodium plus right and chloride chloride minus and so yeah this is definitely gonna break up hundred percent it is a strong electrolyte HF well, HF, believe it or not, is a weak acid. Weak acids do not break up 100%, so we don't worry about this guy. No, no, definitely not as strong. And then this one is an ammonium sulfate. Remember, all ammonium compounds, uh, most sulfate, and you can use your table of solubilities, but this one will break up 100%, so that's a strong electrolyte. And then this one down here, I think sulfuric acid is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, in this case, I would say it is a strong acid for the first dissociation like we talked above I'm gonna go ahead and say yeah it's a pretty strong electrolyte because that first dissociation gives me a hundred percent hydrogen right this is gonna give me a hundred percent right hundred percent it's gonna give me H plus 
plus H SO4 minus, and that's gonna be strong. Okay, number three, label each of the following as true or false, explain your answer. Ammonia in H3 is an Arrhenius base. Well, this is a definition question. If you don't remember your definitions, you're in trouble at this point, so make sure you go back and review them. But remember, Arrhenius said that for a base to be an Arrhenius base, it has to dissolve in water to produce OH, OH minus, right? Hydroxide. Ammonia cannot produce. It does not, doesn't dissociate, right? So, does not dissociate to OH minus, right? An example would be something like sodium hydroxide. That does give us sodium plus and OH minus, but ammonia does not have an OH, so it cannot do that. So this is a false. Ammonia is not, repeat, not an Arrhenius base. However, it is a bronsted lari, and you have to remember that the bronsted lari definition, a base, right? A base is what? A base is an H plus acceptor. And that's really important, and we can write a reaction, right? We can write NH3 um, aqueous, right? And we're going to react that with water, because if, if this is going to be a base, water will be our acid in this case. And we're going to have probably a reversible reaction. Don't worry so much about that. But we're going to end up taking a hydrogen and giving it to uh, ammonia. And we're going to form NH4 plus ammonium, right, which is our conjugate acid over here. And then we form OH minus only in the interaction with water. And that's going to be our conjugate base. So conjugate acid, conjugate base. So again, in this case, bronsted lori gives you a good definition that includes ammonia as a base. Arrhenius's definition of bases does not include ammonia. It only includes things like sodium hydroxide and things like that. So in this bottom one, this one is definitely true. All right, let's move along to page two. These are kind of fun. Uh, predict some reactions and write the net ionic equation. Well, if you look at this first one, we've got magnesium nitrate and sodium hydroxide. These are good examples of uh, double displacement reactions or double replacement reactions, often forming precipitates, but not always. Um, and so in this case, we would swap these things. And so if we have magnesium here, uh, nitrate and sodium hydroxide, we're gonna swap. So magnesium instead of the nitrate, we'll get the hydroxide. So we'll say we'll get some magnesium uh, hydroxide. We have to remember that magnesium is a two plus and hydroxide is only a minus one. So you need two of those. And you better check your table of solubilities. And I believe that um, magnesium hydroxide is insoluble. That is going to be a precipitate. And then finally, the next one would be uh, very simply, the other swap would be sodium nitrate. They are both uh, you got a one plus and a one minus, so that's good. And all nitrates and all sodium salts are soluble, so that's an easy one. Now we need to balance this. Um, we need two hydroxides, so we better put a two there. And that means we have two sodium, so we better put a two here. We only need one magnesium, and we already have the two nitrates, so we are all set there. So now we need to see what breaks up, because we need to write the complete ionic equation. And in this case, we know that magnesium nitrate, all nitrates are soluble. So this is going to completely break up, and I'm going to get uh, magnesium uh, plus, and that's going to be aqueous, right? And I'm going to get, uh, watch my values here, I'm going to get two nitrates, right? Nitrates of minus one, and that's aqueous. And then we're going to get sodium hydroxide, a strong base. All sodium compounds are soluble. So we're going to get uh, Remember, there are two of them, right? Don't forget the two, because that goes to both of these. We're going to get two uh, sodium pluses. That's also going to be aqueous. And finally, two hydroxides, right? And that's aqueous as well. On the product side, we see that this is a solid. This magnesium hydroxide is a precipitate. So we're going to write that undissociated, right? It does not break up. Solids do not break up. And then you have the sodium nitrate, that does break up. Any nitrates, any sodium compounds, there we go. So we're gonna get two uh, sodium pluses and we're gonna get two nitrates, which should give you a clue as to what's gonna come next. So I'm gonna change my color here on my palette and let's see what we got. 
I've got a magne... Oops, looks like I made a little mistake there. Apologize. Magnesium, as I just told you before, is a 2 plus, not a not a 1 plus. So be careful. Don't make little mistakes like that on an exam. It won't cost you big points, but it's really annoying. Um, let's see. I've got magnesium 2 plus here. Uh, I cannot cancel that, so that stays. I've got two nitrates. I've got two nitrates. That definitely cancels. Cancels that. And then I've got two sodiums. I can cancel those. And two hydroxides, I can't cancel those, so I am done. So when I go down here to write my net ionic equation, I write what's left over after the cancellations. And so I got magnesium two plus aqueous plus uh, two hydroxides um, aqueous, and that's gonna give me my insoluble precipitate, the magnesium hydroxide, right? And that's gonna be a solid. So I think that's still balanced, and that's my net ionic equation. Pretty simple there. The next one's a little bit tough, however, that was a really good example of one that I gave you in the notes, right, with the baking soda volcano. This is an example of a gas forming reaction. When you do this one, you might be tempted to write, okay, well, these are gonna swap, so I'm gonna get, uh, well, I'm gonna get my sodium acetate, right? There's my sodium acetate salt. Sodium salts are soluble, so that will be an aqueous. And you may be tempted to write this. You may be tempted to write carbonic acid as an aqueous. Well, whenever you see carbonic acid, that should be a, a, a tip off that this one is not stable. Whenever you see carbonic acid, do not write it as carbonic acid. And this just comes from experience. You wanna write it as water because it decomposes very quickly and it decomposes into carbon dioxide gas. And for anybody who's done the little baking soda experiment when you were a kid, you put vinegar and baking soda together and you've seen these bubbles and these little volcanoes, so you know this is true. So now we can express that in a chemical formula. And so it looks like they're all one to one to one to one. I don't think there's anything crazy here that we need to worry about. Um, but yeah, remember that the carbonic acid, this H2CO3, you never write that as a thing. It always breaks up immediately into one molecule of water and one molecule of carbon dioxide. So now we can write this out. Um, the sodium bicarb, that is a soluble salt. So I will write, um, you've got a sodium plus and that's gonna be aqueous. And you've got one uh, hydrogen carbonate, or if you wanna say bicarbonate, that's perfectly fine too. That is a one minus. And then, this is acetic acid, right? This is acetic acid, you dealt with this in lab. This is a weak acid, it is not one of your strong acids, so you do not break up weak acid. So we leave it as is. So write that one just as it is. It's still aqueous, but it just doesn't break up. And then finally, uh, sodium acetate, that is a salt. That is a sodium salt that does dissociate. That is a soluble salt. So we need to write sodium plus aqueous and we have the acetate ion C2H3O2 you should know that one by now and then of course you have liquid water which is a molecule it does not break up and of course you have CO2 gas as a molecule that does not break up so that is our complete ionic and we'll do the same trick that we did before it looks to me like our sodium ion does go away, but I don't see anything else that cancels. So I will go ahead and just write uh, the remainder as the net ionic equation. Not much to, to cancel out in this case. And so we get the bicarbonate ion um, as the aqueous reacting with the um, acetic acid. And we'll try to write that. That's also aqueous, but does not dissociate very much and that gives us acetate the anion in the aqueous form plus uh, some liquid water plus a molecule of carbon dioxide gas and this is our net ionic equation it's whatever is left over after the cancellations now again sometimes there can be lots of cancels like cancel cancels yeah things that cancel excuse me I need to get some water here give me a second Okay, that's much better. Maybe I can talk again. Okay, so um, sometimes lots of things cancel. Sometimes very few things cancel. And as we saw on the previous page, sometimes nothing cancels, and that's okay. But you got to pay attention. you got to use all the rules we've learned because it's going to be really important. All right. Um, these next few are kind of fun. Uh, this first one's really easy. It's a redox reaction, but it's one that you can balance just by looking at it. And that's pretty cool. 
Um, you look at this one, you've got aluminum uh, reacting with HCl. So what is that going to form? Well, you're probably going to do a single displacement here. This is very similar to the, the magnesium that you did in lab. So it's always good to draw connections of things that you've done in lab. Um, we've got aluminum chloride, and aluminum chloride is AlCl3. And in this case, I believe that's going to be aqueous. And then you're going to have what left over? Well, you're going to form some hydrogen gas. You're going to form some bubbles there of hydrogen gas. We need to balance this. Okay, well, it looks like I need three of these, but if I do three of those, I'm going to get odd numbers. So I better get six of those. Six of those will give me six chlorides, and it will give me three hydrogen gases. Right? i got to have an even number because of that hydrogen gas. You can't break that guy up. And then I think that means I need to have two aluminums. So there you go. And then we can see here that we have aluminum going from zero to aluminum three plus, right? And hydrogen's going from a one plus to a zero. So which one is being reduced, right? The one that's being reduced is the one that's our oxidizing agent. So hydrogen goes from plus to zero. That's a reduction in its um, oxidation state. It's also meaning that it is gaining electrons, so it's going to be the oxidizing agent, the thing that is reduced, so I'll write HCl here. And the thing that is oxidized, the aluminum goes from 0 to plus 3, that's an oxidation. The oxidation state goes up, it loses electrons, which makes it the reducing agent, so aluminum metal is our, um, reducing, our reducing agent there. So that's pretty simple. Now this next one is a really neat kind of dimensional analysis kind of thing. It says, okay, I want to make, I want to make 250 mils of this solution, but I only have this solution. So how much of that do I need? And here, I can't go above 100 because that's all I got. So I can find the moles. That's pretty easy. I can say, okay, I've got 0 0.050 uh, moles. And again, I can't beg you enough. Whenever you see capital M for molarity, always write it as moles per liter because that will guide you in your calculations. The capital M really isn't worth jack when you're doing calculations unless you know what it means. And then here it says, okay, well, what do we got? We got 250 milliliters, so I can convert that to liters. So that's a quarter of a liter. Give me one with sig fig there. And then that will allow me to cancel my liters. I've got moles. And so now what I can do, if I want vol the new volume, I can use this guy. And I can say, uh, I can either divide or multiply. Well, I want volume to be on the top. So I'm going to divide. And that's going to be uh, moles of sodium chloride per liters of sodium chloride, which then means that I've got, if I crank this out, I'm going to get this in liters times uh, you know 100 milliliters per liter and I think that gives me something on the order of 83 milliliters which is still under the hundred that I have possible so my answer makes sense so I needed 83 milliliters of the concentrated one and then I put it into a, a volumetric flask and fill it up to 250 like you did in lab and then that is the new concentration. So there you go. That's pretty simple. I know some of you love the MV equals MV, and if that's the case, you can go to town as long as you make sure to label all of your steps and your calculations. But again, I really hate memorizing equations because if you forget them, you don't remember. So if you just kind of think through it, uh, I basically found the moles that were here divided by the molarity, and that gives me my new liters. In fact, if you let's look at the trail of units here, I've got uh, my liters canceling. I've got my moles canceling, and I'm left with new liters. And so there you go. That's pretty simple. All right, the next one is really just a definition question, asking you how do you explain the difference between heat and temperature? They're very commonly uh, confused words. I'm going to go ahead and do temperature first, right? Temperature is a measure, right, of what? It's the average translational kinetic energy of a substance, of particles in a substance, right? So that's really important, we talked about that. Heat, however, is actually really important. Heat is a type of energy transfer, right? And that's really the key here about energy. It's an energy transfer from what? From an area of high temperature to an area of low temperature. And we talked a lot about this when we did the thermodynamics unit. So hopefully that will help you to go back and look at 
definitions because this is one of those examples of an exam where definitions are going to be really important or you're not going to be able to solve problems. Again, I would say the math is pretty easy. It's just that the uh, understanding. And here's a really good example. This one says a chemical system does that much work. So remember, if a system does the work, it's losing energy or losing energy to the surroundings, right? Um, and so we need to put a negative on that. If the system does work, its energy is going down. And then it says during this process, the internal energy increases. So if it goes up, that's a positive. So, ooh, this is a good one. We've got delta, since you kids love delta E, that is equal to the Q of the system, the heat of the system, plus the work of the system. And we were given that value. We know that E is this one. So the energy went up by 460.0 uh, uh, kilojoules. Keep my sig figs. And I know that's equal to the, it didn't tell me anything about heat. So there's my heat. And that's plus my work. Oh, I do know the work. The work is negative 235.0 kilojoules, which means I saw for Q and this is trivial math again but if you don't know the terminology and the signs you're going to be lost I got positive um, 695.0 kilojoules and since that's a positive value my friends that means this is indeed an endothermic reaction so there you go you got to be able to use these really simple relationships but it's really hard to kind of decipher what's going on if you don't know the vocabulary alright this next one this is like one we did in class um, or on one of the group in class activities. Um, it's really a two parter. First, we want to find Q. And you got to remember here that the Q of the reaction is always equal to the negative Q of the water that's involved, right? So let's think about this really carefully. It's a calorimetry question, right? We're dealing with a coffee cup. And that's important because a coffee cup, remember, coffee cups measure delta H because they measure heat at constant pressure, right? The delta P equals zero, there's no pressure change. So we're talking about enthalpy here when we talk about heat. And so in this one, what are we looking for? We're looking for the heat of the reaction, and this one's tough. We need energy first, and then we gotta find moles. I'm gonna go ahead and find the moles first because I think by this point in the semester, all of you are really confident in your ability to find moles. So we have a small sample of this uh, really dangerous ammonium nitrate. It's the material that is uh, quite explosive um, if not treated right. And one mole of that is basically 84 point, uh, I'm sorry, not 84, it's 80.04. Sometimes I swap numbers around. I apologize. And if I do that right, I get 0. Oh, that's a small amount. 0. 0188 moles of the ammonium nitrate. So that's the bottom part. That's my denominator. So now I need to find the energy. So I can find, I know the mass of the water, I know the temperature change, and I know the specific heat of water. You can look it up on your periodic table. So I can find this value, and all I gotta do is take the opposite sign to get the Q of the reaction. Okay, so I can find Q of water, and I can do it from the specific heat of water. That's gonna be joules uh, over grams, right? Times degrees Celsius, that's easy enough. So if I want joules or kilojoules, we can get to kilojoules, don't worry, but let's start with joules. And I need to get rid of grams, so that means I can multiply 35 grams of water, right? And again, this you gotta put units, you're gonna lose points if you don't put units, I promise you. And then I need delta T to get rid of the degree C on the bottom there. Well, it started at 22.7, so I need final minus initial. So 19.4 degrees C minus 22.7 degrees C. I crank all that out, and I got, because that's going to be, a, the temperature went down, so this value is going to be negative, and I get negative 482.7. I'll keep an extra sig fig because I can, uh, joules. Now remember, if the Q of the reaction is the opposite sign because the energy went from the dissolution to the water, that means it absorbed the heat when the surroundings gave uh, the heat there. So this is going to be a positive, right? 482.8 joules. 
And then I want to take that and say, okay, I'm going to take now combine these pieces together, the moles and the joules, and I'll go 482.8 joules. And I'm going to make sure to say that's positive because it is over 0 0.0188 moles. And then when I do that, remember I got to convert, and then I got to convert to kilojoules by dividing by a thousand. That gives me a positive value and I get 25.7 kilojoules per mole. That is definitely endothermic and it makes sense, right? If it's endothermic because um, it absorbed uh, energy from the water around it causing the water's temperature to go down. So that makes sense. Uh, and I know I didn't ask, but I'm gonna go ahead and say endo just because I like to know what my signs are. Last one says, did we calculate internal enthalpy or did we calculate internal energy? Well, it's definitely, if we just talked about it, the conditions were constant P, and this is the coffee cup, so we can say that we measured delta H, and that's really important. Very good. This next one here, number 10, is kind of like what we did in class most recently, dealing with uh, the fact that you can determine the enthalpy change for a reaction by knowing the enthalpy of formation, the standard enthalpy of formation of the products and the reactants. Remember the elements at their standard states are zero, so you don't have to worry about those. Again, only the elements in their standard state. And it looks like it was already calculated here. So, ooh, this is kind of a tricky one. We're given, we're given this guy, we're given sulfur dioxide, we are given zinc oxide on the table, However, we don't know the heat of formation for this guy. That's kind of neat, so we gotta work backwards here. Okay, we can do that. We can say then that the delta H standard uh, for the reaction is gonna be equal to, well, what's given to us. So we can say it's negative 878.2 kilojoules. And that's gonna equal to essentially what the products minus the reactants, right? So we got to total up all the reactants and the products. So let's, let's go ahead and do the, the products first. So we can do uh, two moles. Um, what do we got here? We'll do the zinc oxide first. And you look on the table there and I get uh, negative 348.3 kilojoules per mole. And then I'm gonna add to that the two moles of the uh, SO2, and that one from the table is negative 296.8 kilojoules per mole. And you add those up, and I got uh, negative 12. I'll keep an extra sig fig just for the time being. Uh, actually, no, I'm good. Uh, kilojoules. And then the reactants, so that was product. For reactants, it's pretty easy. We don't care about the water, right? So, I mean, don't care about the oxygen. It's a standard element in its standard state so that's zero we don't worry about that but we do want this one and this one we say we've got two moles of the zinc sulfide however we do not know the heat of formation for that zinc sulfide that's what we're trying to find that is the unknown right that's really important so now we know this number we know this number we can bring it down I'm just gonna call this if you'll let me I'll call that X so now we bring it all down here. We say we have negative 878.2 kilojoules equals negative 1290.2 kilojoules minus 2x. And if you solve that, it's pretty easy. X equals, what did I got? I got, I got negative 206.0 uh, kilojoules. Now remember, heat's a formation you gotta watch your units. Heats of formation are kilojoules per mole. You know, you can see examples here. So don't forget to write the right units. Um, so that's that guy, and there you go. So, not too hard. Makes it kind of difficult because the one we did in class, uh, we worked, we knew all the ones on the table and we found the overall, but here we can take the overall and if one of the ones on the table is missing, you can find it. And that's really quite useful in, in many, many cases. All right. Moving right along. Oh, I like these guys. Uh, balancing redox reactions. And this one you can kind of tell, I gave you a lot more space, so you probably, you're gonna use acidic conditions, so you can't just look at this one and balance it. You gotta kind of work on this one. And again, I would strongly echo, uh, <laughs> that's really cheesy. I would strongly urge you to use the echo method 
Um, make sure you're, you find a way that works for you. If you like half reactions, then God bless you. You can do that too. It doesn't matter to me. First thing we knew is we got to do is figure out all the oxidation states. Most of them are given to us. We know that oxygen is a negative two. So if this whole thing is a negative one, that means our manganese is a seven plus. And now we can kind of connect them. We can say, okay, iron goes from iron two to iron three. And that looks like it loses one electron. That is an oxidation, right? Manganese goes from seven to two. That looks like a reduction. And wow, that is a five electron reduction. That is mighty, mighty, mighty crazy. Um, that is huge, uh, which means we are gonna need to multiply this one times five to balance our electrons. That's the first step in the process. Looks like we have five electrons that are being transferred. So that means if iron is gonna give up five, manganese consumes those five. So we need to put a five in front of the, all the, the iron things. So let's go ahead and put a five here. And don't forget to write your phases. That's really important. So we're gonna write all these down here. The manganese, we just multiply everything by one. So we don't really need to show that. Um, again, put a five in front of anything that has to do with iron. Right, and that's gonna be aqueous as well. And then finally, we got the leftover manganese. We multiply it by one, so no change there. Now we need to look at the charge. So on the reactant side, I've got five times plus two, so that's 10 minus one. So that's gonna be a positive nine on this side. And on this side, I've got, uh, what is this? I've got five times three is 15 plus two more. Oh my goodness, that is a plus 17. Uh, I'm dealing with acidic conditions. I can only add H pluses, right? If I'm dealing with H pluses, I can add H pluses under acidic conditions because there's lots of those around. So I guess I need to balance these by adding what? I guess I can add eight H pluses on this side and that gives me aqueous, right? And if that balances my charge, uh, I've now messed up the hydrogens. So I think to have H, eight H's over here, I need to have eight H's over here and there's lots of water around. So I can add four waters on this side in the liquid form. There we go. And if I've done, that's the hydrogens. If I've done everything right, I've got four oxygens over here, four oxygens over there. I am balanced. That looks really good. I've balanced my electrons. I've balanced my charge. I've balanced my hydrogens. And if I've done everything right, my oxygen should be my final check. And that looks really good. Again, you gotta be quick on these. You can't take 30 minutes to balance a redox equation or you're not gonna do too well in this exam. All right, this next one is just like the ones we did in class. I give you a bunch of different metals and I ask you to build me the best battery, the best voltaic cell, the best galvanic cell, however you wanna call them. And here are our choices. Well, first thing I wanna do is I wanna find the one that is gonna be the best oxidizer and the best reducer, right? Or if you don't like to turn use it that way, I'd say, okay, which of these is gonna be the strongest as written? And if I look at them, they're all being written as reductions, right? They're all being written as reductions. And how do you get these? You look at the table that's on your periodic table. And it looks to me like the voltages here of these 10 going from 10.4 to 10.2 is by far the best one to be reduced. So this is gonna be my best oxidizing agent, which means that the lowest one then wants to be flipped, right? We'd rather flip this one and that's gonna give me a positive, right? That's gonna give me a positive 0.76. We wanna find the biggest gap here, right? And that's gonna be my reducing agent because it wants to be oxidized instead of reduced. And so now we can, we can build this out. So we can say that the E cell for this, um, it's up to you. Um, I'm gonna say in this case, um, it's gonna be 0.15 volt. That's for my reduction. And then I'm gonna add my oxidation, which is gonna be 0.76 volts and I get uh, 0.91 volts positive, which is pretty good, almost a volt, that's pretty good. If you wanna do it the way the book does it, or some of the other ways, you can say, okay, I wanna take 0.15 minus a negative 0.76, it works out to give you the same answer. I don't care which way you solve it, but you need to be able to solve it. And so there you go. And now we need to draw a little picture. Oh, that's easy enough. We draw a couple beakers as best we can. A couple beakers, you know how this goes at this point. Uh, you need some kind of electrode. You need some kind of electrode over here. And I'm gonna go ahead and put my uh, zinc over here so I can say that this guy is gonna be a bar of zinc. Cause again, zinc is solid, right? So zinc solid is zero. And then I better have some zinc uh, two plus in here. Probably some nitrate or something to make sure I balance it, some salt solution right, that's gotta be in a solution. 
And then I'm gonna have, uh, what is this? This is gonna be where my oxidation happens. So oxidation happens at the anode. That's really important. And that means that this is our cathode. And cathodes are where reduction happens. And this is a kind of a tricky one, check it out. In this case, you've got a solution, but you've got 10, four plus going to 10, two plus. There's no solid here. So you need to stick in some little piece of metal. Um, I don't care, you could have called this 10 metal. You could have called it, uh, you could have put a, any kind of piece of metal here. It doesn't really matter because there's no solid in this reaction. And then of course we probably wanna put in some nitrate or something to make sure it's a salt. And then finally, the last thing we need to make sure we have, or almost the last thing is we need to have a salt bridge. And again, I don't care what's in that salt bridge right now. And then finally, you wanna connect these two pieces of metal for the electrons to travel. And remember, electrons always go from what to what? They go from the anode to the cathode. So that means we have electrons going in this direction from anode to cathode. And again, this is just very similar to what was in your book. Uh, the only thing that was tricky here was that we had two things that were not a solid, so I had to make sure to add an electrode because you can't attach a wire to an ion. You need a piece of metal and, you know, tin or some other, uh, you could have used platinum. I don't care what you needed, but you needed something that was going to be an electrode. Okay. Last page, home stretch. I know this is getting a little bit long, but I'm doing my best. All right. These are not so difficult, so let's take a look here. We got a flask of an unknown monoprotic acid, so that basically tells us one to one ratio for acid to base, right? Because we're dealing with sodium hydroxide and we've got a monoprotic acid. Um, and we've got, we need to know, oh, okay, it took us this many milliliters of that concentration sodium hydroxide to reach the equivalence point. So that gives us, right, if we have this, this will give us moles of base. And if we have moles of base and it's one to one, it gives us moles acid and we wanna find the molecular mass. In order to do that, what do we need? We need to know grams, the G won't go away, grams per mole, so it's almost like two problems. Okay, that's easy enough. Well, the grams are given to us. That's nice, so 0 0.750 grams of acid. We need to find the moles. Oh, that's easy enough. If we know we have 1.1000 moles of base, over liters of base, right? And we know that we have 0 0.03673 liters of base. And you know that for every one mole of base, in this case is one mole of acid, that should give us moles of acid. That's what we want, okay. And if we crank that out, if you do it right, and you hit the calculator buttons right, I think you get 0 0.00, what do we get here? Uh, oh, that's pretty easy. I didn't even need a calculator for that one. Three moles of acid. So you can bring that down here. So 0 0.003673 moles. And if you crank that out, I think that gives you 204.2 grams per mole. So this one again, don't memorize equations, just look. It says, I need to calculate the molar mass. I need grams, I need moles. The grams are given. I can find moles from the titration data. I put them together and boom, I get the grams per mole, which is what the problem wants. Same thing down here. This one again, wants to find the molar mass. So what do you need? You need grams and you need moles. Well, look at the problem. The problem gives you the grams, so that's easy. 3.50 grams of whatever that is. So I guess I gotta find the moles. And what is this? It's a gas. And it occupies all these conditions. Okay, or it occupies a volume of this many, oh, well I don't know what milliliters are, so I better convert this to liters, right? This is Tor, I better go to ATM. Oh, look at this, 36 degrees C, I better go to Kelvin. And if I do that, I can find the moles by using, you said it, PV equals NRT. And I know I need to find moles, so I can rearrange this. So moles equals N, so that is PV over RT. Really, really handy equation. So now if I convert these all, I get uh, 1.309 ATM, and the volume is 0 0.8460 liters. 
And the reason we need those specific units is because of the version of the gas constant we use, 0 0.0821, and that's units of liters ATM over moles Kelvin. So if you don't get the right units, these aren't going to cancel and you're going to be in big trouble. And I get uh, 309.2 Kelvin. If I do all of that hard work, I got 0 0.04 three six uh, I think I'm stuck with three sig figs there because I didn't take enough yeah it doesn't matter I'll just stay at three uh, moles of this gas I can plug it in over here 0 0.0436 moles and if I crank this one out I get something like 80.3 grams per mole so I like these because they show you that you can if you had an unknown compound like if you're a forensic chemist uh, investigating a crime scene, you could find uh, the molar mass of this material and potentially identify it by either titration or by collecting a gas sample. That's that's pretty cool. All right, this last one here is essentially a holdover from one of our previous lab no uh, uh, sorry not lab notebook it's uh, one of our class uh, handouts that I thought was really cool but we never got time to really go over it. I asked you to do it on your own but I, I'm guessing some of you didn't do it so. I figured we'd try to give it a shot. The equation should look rather familiar because we just talked about it. This is the one where we form the carbonic acid, right? The H2CO3, but we said that isn't really stable, so we're gonna keep it as water and some carbon dioxide gas. And finally, you're gonna get a little bit of sodium um, acetate. There we go. And I did this one up above, so you know, see above for writing the net ionic equation. Uh, pretty simple. But I do want to solve for the uh, percent or the, the theoretical yield rather. And this is fun because it combines both a uh, gas and a solid. So here's what we have. We've got five grams of sodium bicarb. So let's see what we get. If all five grams reacts. I'm going to go ahead and write the formula here. So label everything. And if you uh, look up the molar mass, right? So one mole of sodium bicarb. We're trying to find how much. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and stop uh, with, with uh, it says go to liters, but I'm going to find moles. And I'll show you why that is in a minute. Um, so we're going to get this. Um, there we go. So we've got, now we've gone to moles of sodium bicarb, but we don't want that. We want moles of what? We want moles of carbon dioxide. So one mole CO2. And when I get that, I get something like 0 0.0595 moles CO2. And I'm pretty sure you guys are really bright and you see where I'm going with this. If I go to liters, I have to do a whole PV equals NRT just like we did above. And I don't want to waste my time if this isn't my limiting reagent, right? Because only the limiting reagent gives you a theor theoretical yield. So I'm going to work out both of them, stop at moles, find out which one is my theoretical yield, or my theoretical yield, and then I'm going to solve for PV equals NRT. I don't want to solve it twice if I get it wrong. So now what I need to do is, oh, check it out. I've got a concentration of vinegar, so i got to go... 0 0.825 uh, moles, and I'm going to call acetic acid AA just because I'm in a hurry. AA coming from acetic acid per liters of AA. As long as you tell me what, you know, you can sit here and you can say this is AA circle, and I can say, okay, well, I've got 85 milliliters, so I can find moles if I know the volume. 0 0.0850 liters of acetic acid and I know that there's one mole of acetic acid for every one mole of CO2 from my equation and if I crank this out I get 0 0.0701 moles of CO2. Now I have to ask the most important question which of these is my limiting reagent? Well as soon as I hit this value right here I run out of sodium bicarbonate so I have to stop. So once I stop, this is the most I can make. Because if I made this much, I would need more sodium bicarbonate. So sodium bicarbonate is my limiting reagent, which gives me my theoretical yield. So there we go. Now, 
The nice thing here is I stopped at moles, so now I can use, you guessed it, I can use PV equals NRT, and in this case I want to find the liters, so I need to find volume, which is NRT over P, and the values up above are given to you, so you can say, okay, well, I know the moles, right? This is equal to N, this is my theoretical yield, the maximum amount. I can go 0 0.0595, uh, got moles of CO2. Uh, the gas constant, 0 0.0821 uh, liters. And you gotta, if you're gonna use this, you gotta write the units. Don't be lazy and just write numbers because you're gonna lose points. And then this was, uh, I think, 25 degrees C, so I need to add 273 to it, and I get uh, 298.2 Kelvin. Remember, there are no degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. And, oh, I was, I was so nice to you, and I gave you one ATM to save a little time. And if I do this, I think I get something along the lines of 1. Uh, is it like 1.46 liters, something like that. My math may be a little bit off, but I think you get the idea. So there you go, little kitchen volcano experiment. Okay, I know I went really quickly because I didn't want this to be hours and hours long. In fact, I think I hit it under an hour, which made me happy. It's about one class period. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, again, I'll have a review session um, Monday night. And if you missed that or you can't make it, um, you got the QSC on Tuesday as well as SI. So I hope this is helpful to you. And um, good luck on your exam. Please make sure you show up on time. Don't be stressed out. Make sure to eat before you come and uh, you know, get, get a little bit of sleep the, sleep the night before. Staying up until all hours is not gonna help you. You wanna be able to have your game face on and feel that you, uh, you know, did your best and, and you, know, you gave your all and, and you can earn those points as best you can. So um, talk to you later. Good luck.